Okay, so our uh, operational challenges here, this is like the exact same slide that we had in the membrane filtration lecture too. We're talking about fouling. But I will point out that this is more appropriate for reverse osmosis and nanofiltration because this is talking about biofouling. So you have bacteria coming in. Bacteria have this extros extracellular polymeric substance sticking on the edge. We call it EPS. Actually, there's a lot of different terms for it, but that's one of the more common terms. EPS, it's the sticky stuff from bacteria. They tend to stick to the membrane. Even if the bacteria die, their sticky stuff remains. They're extracellular polymers. Or they might grow on the membrane and form a biofilm. You don't get this biofilm formation in microfiltration and ultrafiltration. Why do you think that is? Knowing what you know about MF and UF now, why don't you get a biofilm forming? How did we operate MF, UF? Yes. Dead end, the backwash, that's right. Um, in in uh, MF and UF, we backwash it really regularly. And that kind of prevents a biofilm from forming because it's continually being backwashed. Uh, NF and RO, you can't really do a backwash. One thing that we, that we need to point out is that the membrane area required for RO and NF is much higher because our fluxes are much, much lower. And with such low fluxes, you can't really get um, a good, like, strong flow through the membrane that would wash something off. And then besides that, the reverse osmosis modules are not built to be able to backwash anyway. Remember we had that permeate carrier membrane, which was a really tight mesh, and, or permeate carrier, I should say, that the membrane sat on top of. And so that permeate carrier can handle the really high pressure needed to force water through the membrane. The feed spacer is on the top of it, but the feed spacer is just designed to change the hydrodynamics of the flow. If you were to reverse the backwash, or reverse the flow to have backwash, then you'd push your membrane onto the feed spacer, but the feed spacer was a larger network of, uh, of channels, and so the membrane would just be punctured as it was forced into that feed spacer mesh, okay? So you can't really backwash a reverse osmosis module, and it probably wouldn't work very well anyway because the flows are so low that it's not gonna sweep away anything, okay? That's why we deal with biofilms that form on the RO membranes. So what we have to do is send cleaning chemicals, and when we clean these systems, we just flush them essentially by running, you know, uh, sodium hydroxide, maybe some uh, hydrochloric acid, so high base, uh, I mean high pH bases or low pH acids. We might use something like citric acid that has a chelating ability to, um, or like soaps and surfactants to clean the membrane, but it's always tricky to clean the reverse osmosis membranes. So that's why the research that I do is actually geared toward fouling and how do we prevent the fouling. Okay. Here's uh, some more description of the biofouling. It's interesting, biofilms grow similar to trees and for similar reasons. Like the bugs will start down here, but you can imagine if the bugs are, are down here and a lot of them are inside the biofilm, then the bugs that grow on top of them are going to take all the nutrients and take all the, uh, well, oxygen if they're growing aerobically and uh, organic matter and other nutrients that come in will be taken up by the outside. So it's more efficient to grow this way where you have a big biofilm that kind of spreads out where it can gather the nutrients better. And if you think about it, that's what trees do too, right? They spread out where they can get more light and... Um, and other nutrients, the CO2 that they use to grow. Similar kind of thing with, with biofilms. I've always thought that was kind of an interesting um, analogy there. So what do we do to prevent biofouling and other fouling? We have to do pretreatment. What would you use for pretreatment if you had to for RO and NF? Just like in lab, we had to do some things. Jacob? Oh. Yeah, Jacob. Any idea? All right, Kim, what would you do for pretreatment? Yeah, all the same things that we've already talked about. Coagulation, flagellation, sedimentation, you can do that for, uh, for pretreatment. 
You can use microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes to pretreat it before you get to the reverse osmosis. You can use um, sand filters. Yeah, we didn't say the sand filter after the coagulation flocculation. But all, everything we do to remove the big stuff, we can do. And then we can let the membranes just handle the salts. That's what they're really there for, is to remove the salts and the other small molecular weight organic uh, materials. So, <coughs> at a stage system. And cleaning, we kind of talked about this already. All right. Sometimes you need post treatment too, because the permeate can be super clean. Does anyone have a water bottle on them? A, uh, a purchased water bottle? A lot of times, did, did you pull hold one up? Oh yeah, let's see it. Let's see what's in there. So we've got this uh, Southern Home Purified Drinking Water. It says purified by reverse osmosis. All right, there you go. But, uh-oh, where's the ingredients list? Oh, you don't have ingredients on this one. Did you buy this in a big pack or something? Yeah, so the ingredients must have been on the outside of the, of the label. But what you'll see on the label is it'll have water, will be the main thing. <laughs> we hope it's mostly water. Hydrogen and oxygen. What's that? Oxygen and hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. It's water. Atomically speaking, it's hydrogen and oxygen. But molecularly speaking, it's water. But, um, but they'll add like uh, magnesium and some other minerals just to give it better taste. Because if you, if you let it go just straight through the reverse osmosis, you'd have essentially distilled water. Has anyone ta tasted distilled water that you can buy at the store? It tastes super flat, right? Is that, or? It's gross. It's gross, it doesn't taste good. So, in other words, RO can get your water too clean. And then you gotta add some salts back. Sometimes you need to add carbon dioxide too, because you need alkalinity, and, um, that prevents corrosion in the pipes. So very pure water is really corrosive. And if you let just RO water go into your pipes, all the, all the stuff that has built up over the years would dissolve and get into the water and you'd have serious problems. So we gotta increase, increase the salt a little bit after. That's also motivation for using NF when you can. Like we might as well not use RO and just use NF to let some of the salts leak through and then maybe we won't have to add salts back after we're done with the process. All right, so these are the outcomes of the lecture that you can read on your own. Any questions or thoughts on that? All good?